You're listening to the Modern Acre Podcast. Every week, you'll hear from the entrepreneurs, innovators, and leaders that are changing the food and agricultural industry on and off the farm. Your hosts are Tim and Tyler Nuss. They are brothers, fifth-generation farmers, and entrepreneurs who have scaled tech startups, developed international supply chains, and built brands. The Modern Acre is ag built different. Hey guys, you're listening to episode 105 of The Modern Acre. Yeah, Tyler and I just wrapped up an interview before recording this intro, and I'm uh, watching the puppy alone this week. My wife's in L.A. for work, so it was a little stressful. Puppy was starting to act up mid-interview, and I didn't know what to do. Tim, this has been a quite a learning experience for you, huh? It's been quite the learning experience. You uh, you shared that podcast with me earlier. It's the Tim Ferriss podcast, and he had Ryan Holiday on, and the first part of the interview, they're talking about Tim Ferriss getting a dog for the first time and all the changes that went along with it, and it hit very close to home. Yeah, I think it's like character building or something like that. Yeah, it's definitely definitely making me become a little bit more selfless. We didn't think it was possible, but here, here we are. Here we are. Well, guys, thanks so much for tuning in. We're pumped that you're listening and really appreciate the support. We've got a great episode for you today. Uh, I think we need to jump right in. Today, we're interviewing Clint Brower of Greenfield Robotics. Yeah, this is a super fun interview with Clint. He's based in Kansas, and he's had a really interesting background and career leading up to where he's at right now with Greenfield. What Greenfield is really looking to do is to take the chemicals out of food, which is an interesting premise for a company, but essentially they're creating automated harvesters that are first tackling broad acre crops to go and do weeding. Yeah, so they're developing a robotic weeder and like Tim mentioned, with the goal of reducing chemical use, uh, so really leaning into you know the regenerative strategy. So Clint is the co-founder and CEO at Greenfield, so he he shares more about the journey and you know like Tim mentioned his background in tech and what ultimately led him to to found the company and and how they've been scaling and growing and. They're very early on in the the product development, but they have some ambitious plans over the next year or two. So we're excited to jump in on this. Yeah, Clint's also a farmer himself and operates a a farm there in Kansas. So he has just really good perspective of actually executing at the farm level to, to develop this technology. This is a really good conversation. Let's jump right in. Hey, Clint, welcome to the show. Good to have you here. Thanks. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. Yeah, we're excited to talk to you and talk a little bit about what you're up to with Greenfield. But before we started the interview, you were talking to us about some interesting statistics about uh, prevented plantings that occurred this year. Yeah, that's right. Um, You know, just uh, I was just thinking about this year. There was about 19 million acres uh, prevented plant on broad acre crops this year. So soybean, corn, milo, stuff like that. And the average is normally around 4.8. And uh, I was just thinking about my own experiences. It's the first time on our farm here that uh, we've ever had to claim prevented plant um, due to the, you know, just excessive rainfall. And just, you know, what does that look like if, if these types of trends continue where it's hard to plant crops? What, do, what does that do, right, on a global basis? No, I think that's super interesting. I hadn't heard that before. And I think your point is is a good one with potentially changing climate and, you know, a lot of the economic factors that come into play. I think it's a really interesting, really interesting thing you bring up. Well, Clint, let's take let's take it back um, a little bit. Maybe maybe share with us where you grew up and uh, your early career. Well, I grew up actually not too far from where I'm at now. I'm at Cheney, Kansas. Grew up about 30 minutes from here uh, near Wichita, Kansas, for perspective. And, uh, you know, look, I, I grew up doing uh, the things kids do here, uh, at least when you grow up a little bit rural. And I did ag stuff, uh, 4-H, you know, crop farming. Both sides of my family came from farming and uh, had animals, you know, a few beef and, and some Holsteins and stuff like that. And, um, and uh, you know, and, and hated it eventually. <laughs> And uh, went to K-State, got a couple degrees, and uh, said, I want to get as far away from this as I can, and uh, went out and got into technology, and uh, and specifically the internet, in uh, 1997, um, and which was an interesting time to get into it, right? And uh, so did a lot of startups. I mean, one of the benefits that I've had when you get into an industry that's completely new is you get to do a lot of different things. And so just a lot of experiences sort of punching above my weight. 
um, at that point and a lot of startups, you know, uh, a lot of independent startups and also several startups within Sony. Yeah, it's always good to hear those stories. And I think a common theme for a lot of people in agriculture that grow up very close to it and go out and kind of test the waters with other industries and ultimately make it back to agriculture. So that's always really cool to see you. So maybe kind of talk to us more recently about what you're doing currently with Greenfield Robotics, how the idea came about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, I came back to the agriculture industry for a very simple reason. You know, I uh, decided I wanted to um, try to get chemicals out of out of food as much as possible. Um, I'm there's no blame to go around for how we got there. We're doing exactly as farmers, what consumers asked us to do for the past 50 years, and that is get prices down. Um, so there's no, there's no blame game here, but I thought surely technology has developed enough to the point that we can probably get chemicals out of it. And when I was sort of debating what I wanted to do with, uh, the rest of my life decided that I wanted to learn how to farm without chemicals. So on the family farm started growing stuff on veg with vegetables, um, greenhouse crops, and we grew about a hundred different vegetables. Uh, at one point we grew even hydroponic with my cousin and we distributed into all the whole foods in Kansas city and high V's, uh, restaurants, schools, we're still doing some of that and, um, never used any chemicals. Anything I ever used was Omri organic certified and, uh, grew all those different things. And so being on a mission to try to change sort of chemicals and, and getting them out, I decided, well, you know, we need to be able to do on the rest of the farm, which is broad acre, right? So corn, soybean, milo, wheat. And immediately, you know, ran into a problem. Um, and that problem was I didn't want to till. There's a lot of issues with tillage that I think we're all aware of now. And But I wanted to control weeds without chemicals. And there simply is not a viable way to do that currently. And so about four years ago, I started testing a method. And that sort of has led to Greenfield Robotics. Such a cool story about how you got there and, you know, you saw a problem in the industry or what you thought was a problem and started executing uh, on it and mapping out a solution on your own farm. So I just, I love that. Um, I think a lot of times people see a problem and and to your point, it's the blame game, but you, you went out and said, well, I'm just going to do it. Um, So I, I love that. So maybe, maybe talk through what were the early steps to build the business? It sounds like you've maybe been in a R and D phase over the past few years years? Maybe where have you been and, and where are you now? Sure, sure. It's It's been a process. I mean, I have to say uh, it's been an easier process than trying to sort of rebuild the family farm was. <laughs> so, um, but it uh, the process basically was uh, four years ago, you know, I just started doing it with things you have on hand. And, and, and that's kind of the way you do things in the tech industry. You don't go out with some elaborate plan. You figure out what is the fastest way to get to minimal minimum viable product and to test your theory. So I tested it using, you know, a compact tractor and a rotary mower. What happens when I repeatedly mow pigweed at two inches, two and a half inches high as, you know, a rotary mower? And, and, and what I found was interesting. And so I did that over a couple different summers, over different conditions, and I just wanted to see, like, what happens when it's wet? What happens when it dry, and when it's dry? Because pigweed is this, this huge problem, right? And I liked what I saw. I came up with this idea and thought, well, how, you know, how can we do this? And came up with an idea for small bots that wouldn't weigh very much, that would run between the rows, and they would essentially rove pigweed without chemicals. And I spent also a lot of time walking around in fields to make sure I wasn't wrong that most of the weeds were actually between the rows, right? Not in row. And uh, went and met with uh, someone I'd worked with 20 years prior who has spent the last decade of his life writing machine vision software called RoboRealm. There's about 60,000 users, not downloads, users of it, including we've tracked guys at NASA using it for prototyping and whatnot. And that's what he's done. And he's the most brilliant programmer I'd ever worked with. And uh, I sat down with him and said, look, is it possible to, to do this? Um, I think it is. I think it's, you know, and he said, yeah, you know, and his name's Stephen Gettner. He's, he's, he's partners in this with me now. And, and, uh, he said, you know, I get a lot of dumb robotics ideas coming my way, but this one's actually something that could be done. And, uh, so from there, 
Uh, we grabbed another guy that I'd worked with a long time ago that Stephen was working with named Carl Sutter. And both those guys, actually interesting enough, they uh, were the first guys, they were part of a team to be the first guys to hook a robotic arm to the internet in 1994. And they're in a museum somewhere. And it was called the Telegarden. And you could actually grow, imagine this, in 1994, you could actually garden over the internet with what they built. Um, so they've been at this a long time. Well, that's really impressive, and it looks like you've assembled a, a pretty good team to to get this business off the ground. Maybe talk to us about commercialization and when you expect to kind of launch this um, to a larger user base. Yep. Um, last year, we we had four bots. We ended up kind of settling on a on a design. Of course, we're always improving it, and uh, we maintained about twenty five acres of soybeans um, here. This year, we're going to maintain. Uh, hopefully a minimum of uh, 600 acres of uh, soybeans, milo, cotton, and uh, um, corn. And so most likely in this region, we're also in discussions with some organic farms. And uh, so that's that's the plan this year. We're building 10 of them. And, and for the first time, they'll all be built here in Kansas. And actually, those bots should all be done March 1st. And, uh, and then we'll go out and do that. And then next year, um, we plan on scaling it quite a bit. And so we're actually um, taking kind of reservations from farmers and trying to figure out, you know, who do we work with the following year and where. That's exciting. Just what you have mapped out. Maybe maybe talk a little bit more about the product and the, the go-to-market strategy. Is this is this something that the bot goes over the field once a day, once a month? What does that look like? And do you plan to you sell direct to consumer or have it on some sort of subscription basis? It's robotics as a service. And uh, so what we say, the robots, the way they work essentially is, uh, let's just take a soybean example. Um, They're going to go over that field between two and five times, depending on what's going on. I've actually never seen it at five, but you always hedge your bets. And so what they're doing is these little bots, we'll take 10 of them this year and we'll drop them off at a field. They already know where they're going to go. We've already pathed where they're going to go. We flew a drone over the field and, and, and know where your your, uh, your rows are at. And we've already pathed them. They know where they're going to go before they're even at the field. Once we drop them off, they start going in, and then they use machine vision to steer themselves. They're electric power. They're battery powered. The batteries we use right now run six to eight hours, it looks like. And so, you know, after five or six hours, we'll, we'll, we'll swap them out. Now, this year, for sure, someone's going to be there at the edge of the field monitoring them the whole time. So last year, we built software that allows us to, um, one, create our own internet at the field. And two, using that internet, we can um, log into any of the machines and have a full motion video and uh, full controls using a PC or, or whatever we want to control them with. And so someone will be at the edge field, and these things are driving autonomously. As of uh, this week, we have um, the bots can drive up a road, turn the corner, and drive down the next row. So that's that's kind of how it'll work this year. We'll deploy 10 of them, and, and we'll be on the edge. And, and to be honest, it's going to be me and Steven myself <laughs> standing there, uh, you know, making sure everything's working okay, right? Yeah, that's really impressive and looks like some good progress leading up until this year to, to expand it a little bit. Yeah. Clint, maybe talk to us about competition in the space. There's a few few companies kind of tackling autonomous weeding. Maybe talk to us about how you're different from from those type of companies. Yep, um, most of them so far, and you know, there, there's some great companies and people doing great work. And and this space is, you know, you're going to see a lot of robotics in fields right over the next ten years. And uh, most of them so far fall into one of two categories. They either do some sort of tilling, and you primarily see that in uh, vegetable ones, you know, specialty crops, stuff like that, where they're doing a lot of strip till. Um, So those guys, you know, NIO would be one of them, NIO Technologies. They've been around quite some time, and they have some pretty impressive machines and capabilities. So so that's one. Uh, So they till, which we we do not till. And then the other ones spray, you know, herbicides. So the idea is I'm going to reduce, I'm going to be very targeted on the herbicides. We're going to identify every plant and not accidentally spray the wrong one. And we're different than that in that our goal is to get rid of herbicides entirely. And so we're going to always use mechanical means, but without trying to disturb the soil. So those are really, you know, everyone else falls into one of those two categories, uh, I think, at this point. What are some of the biggest challenges you've faced so far? 
one of the things that's been interesting to me was just explaining farming to people that are interested in investing. It's been a real uh, shock to me that I'm not sure 50 percent of the of, of the population knows what plowing is. And I don't know why I was shocked by that, but I was. And it makes it very difficult <laughs> to explain what you're doing. Um, and it takes a long time, right? And so that that was just a stunner to me, um, just how little people understand about farming. Yeah, it seems like there's a continued disconnect between those two groups. So it's kind of continued education and when we had talked a while back, we were talking about the disconnect with with consumers and farmers as well. So I think that's yeah. goes to the point of just continually to communicate what you're doing on the farm and educating those different stakeholders. And yeah. maybe for, maybe further that further to that, talk a little bit about how you plan to kind of grow the business once you commercialize. Um, how are you going to get the word out and market the business? Yeah, I think that on that, I you know. You know, branding and marketing and all that, it, it's something I'm not terribly concerned about. I think that, um, you know, if you look at Google, I mean, they didn't run ads forever, right? And, and they just did a darn good job of the technology they provided. And uh, and they did it in a way that was extremely affordable, right? And so that's kind of our goal is I want to, you know, we want to innovate this in a way that it's it's just easy. It's almost seamless for farmers to adopt. It doesn't change their economic model whatsoever. It folds into the way they finance things and 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 the benefits are obvious. And um, so that that's really what we set it up. And, and we've probably thought this out. You know, you always think things out four or five years where it goes and. And I think at the end of the day, what we're doing here is realigning, you know, like you had mentioned, consumers and farmers. And no one really wants to see chemicals of any sort. I don't care how targeted. Uh, they don't want to see it. And uh, farmers don't want to till if they can avoid it. Everyone knows the benefit. It's just sometimes it's it's very difficult not to till, right? And so we think that uh, we realign a lot of things. And from that will come a lot of value that, that uh, hopefully farmers can capitalize on. No, I mean, I, it totally makes sense. I mean, I think in terms of, of marketing, it's always about having differentiation. And when your product can be the differentiator and speak for itself, that's that's ultimately what, what everyone needs and what should be striving for when you have a product that solves a problem, it's yeah. intuitive. And um, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Let me add to that. I mean, really, really what we're, the, where we are and what we do, anything we do, I've already done on my farm. Right. So everything's tested on my farm. Everything is bedded. Any problem we're trying to solve is a problem that I'm trying to solve. Right. And so we actually have three to maybe four. We're trying to decide how it's going to go other bots uh, on the design board. Right. And at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do is allow regenerative ag in a broad acre setting to scale. That's what we're doing. And so, you know, we bought whatever you want to call it. We don't even have a name for it, to be honest with you. Um, that is, that's the first one. Um, but that's the first one of, of several uh, in the pipeline. And we really, you know, think that if we get this built out, we will, farmers will find themselves in a position where their inputs are limited that they need and they will feel uh, very profitable and they will be aligned with consumers because there's going to be really nothing that they can't explain that they're doing. I, I love that mission. I mean, I think that's something we've seen in the regenerative space is how do you transition to regenerative at a more uh, production scale? So I think uh, it's it's a big problem. I think it's impossible, to be honest, right now. <laughs> Totally. No, I mean, I think we're, we're seeing that on our farm as, as we look, you know, in this direction and, you know, having companies that are focused on solving that problem, it's a huge need. So I, I love that that's your long term vision. And there's a lot of products and services that can come from that mission. Yeah, I'm excited about it. honestly, I didn't know. I mean, that was the path I was going down with the, you know, our broad acre. And then a few years ago, the pet food company that I work with, um, Canada, they had a consultant and he goes, hey, I think what you actually do is called regenerative ag. And I'm like, never heard of it. <laughs> and so, you know, here we are. Right. And I thought, well, I guess I was I was reaching some very good conclusions. Right. Uh, I'm not alone. And that's actually a good feeling. Right. Because if it's just you, you're like, am I crazy? You know, is this right? Yeah, it's interesting to see like the, the regenerative movement the past year or so where it's becoming more and more mainstream and consumers have an idea about it now, but the principles themselves have been 
handled by uh, by farmers for quite a long time. It's yeah. not uh, not not recent practices that that regenerative is. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And in a broad acre setting, I mean, the most inter- interesting thing to me about it on a broad acre setting is if we hadn't had chemicals, if we hadn't had no till farming as a result of those chemicals, we probably wouldn't even be here. Right. And so I'm trying to get rid of chemicals, but I recognize that this opportunity, this ability to kind of change things in a positive way doesn't even exist if the chemicals that I'm trying to eliminate didn't in the first place. Clint, talk about the importance of technology and how you leverage it throughout your business. You want to be careful what you're doing. So, uh, you know, I I don't want to get into depth here, but, you know, at one point I, I was pretty sophisticated data marketer before it was sort of cool to do so. Data, you know, science, big data. And, and I did that. And that was kind of where I made my name at Sony. And uh, one of the things, you know, I learned through that process is being very, very careful about what technology you're using and what data you're collecting. And be very careful that you don't collect stuff that you don't know how you're going to use. And I felt like when I see a lot of presentations in farming now and technology, everyone's talking about data. And it's like deja vu for me because I saw the same thing going on in the Internet, uh, you know, 15 years ago and everyone talking about things. But then I would sort of pull behind the curtain and go, well, what are you doing with it? And the answer was not a lot. And so I think we're kind of at that situation here. So I'm very careful. I know it sounds crazy, but as a technology guy, you know, I, I'm very careful what, what I use in my life and, and, and what, we, what we do with it. You know, it needs to be actionable, right? Definitely. Well, Clint, this has been a really awesome conversation, kind of digging into Greenfield. And as we wrap up uh, this piece, maybe talk about your focus over the next 12 months for the business. A year from now, what does success look like for you? Let's see. We're still in business. <laughs> um, no, seriously, we have, um, I, you know, every year I'd like to be building 10 times the amount of bots we did the previous and deploying them on, you know, multiple fields, multiple types. You know, we want to be serving both organic and conventional fields. And I'd like to have the prototypes of uh, the, other, you know, other three or four prototypes, at least as prototypes instead of just sort of design. Right. And uh, that's where I'd like to be a year from now. We'll see if we get there. It'll be exciting to watch you guys go down that path and and see where you're at. Clint, as we move to our next section called Quick Takes, what's your favorite business book? Uh, uh, It's a strange one, uh, but it it was one I read when I think I was around 16, 17, somewhere in there. It was called Power Shift um, by Alvin Toffler. And it was, uh, I've always been a big reader and it was the one that sort of cemented in my mind the uh, importance of uh, knowledge and how much you can get out of it. And I guess a a quote, you know, that Alvin Toffler is known for is knowledge is the most democratic source of power, you know, versus wealth or force. Right. And so um, I've always sort of pursued a lot of of knowledge. And uh, so that that book had just a massive impact me. and, And that's actually what sort of led me to technology in the first place. What's something you've changed your mind about recently? Yoga. I do it all. I, I do yoga now. <laughs> uh, I'm getting a little older, so there's a lot of sports I probably can't do safely anymore. So I've changed my mind and uh, adopted yoga and uh, do quite a bit of it, actually. <laughs> That's an awesome answer. <laughs> what are you spending too much money on right now? You know, one of the things that's hard with a startup is you spend a lot of time fundraising. Um, it really just takes a ton of time raising funds to, to do these things. And, uh, so time is money, right? So if you're asking me how much, you know, what am I spending it on too much time? It's, it's unfortunately fundraising, but that's, that's the way it is, right? What are you not spending enough on? One of the reasons I moved back to Kansas was for family, you know, uh, my dad had Parkinson's and, uh, and, uh, he did pass last year and, um, you know, I wanted to make sure I spent time, but I still feel like I don't spend enough time with my mom. Uh, certainly not, you know, my sisters are in, in Kansas and also New York, but um, I don't feel like I have enough time in the hours, in the days, like everyone else to the, the people that I love, right? Sisters, uh, my, my wife, of course, and her kids. So, and I guess on top of that, I don't feel like I have enough time to read books. What issue or trend do you find most compelling in agriculture today? Well, I mean, you're going to guess that. I mean, regenerative ag, I I really just think that, um, I think it has incredible upside. And I think 
<clears throat> it really realigns the farmers and consumers because it, I think it makes farming more profitable, but also does the things that everyone would, you know, that eats food would like to see happen. Yeah, that one's definitely top of mind for us. It seems to be coming up in, in, in the, every interview we've had in the recent months. What app can you not live without? You know, it's, it's funny. I, uh, I'm not a big app guy. I mean, Google Maps, I, I have a feeling, let's put it this way, probably the one that would be very hard to live without as we're adding farms and working with farmers is Google Maps, right? <laughs> so trying to find a field or uh, a farm. Um, but, um, you know, it's funny. I, I, I think that uh, we spend too much time trying to create apps for everything. So I, I don't, you know, there's, there's very few I could, you know, uh, but I got to have a PC, right? I got to have a laptop, got to have that. But uh, as far as apps, there's not a lot that I use. Clint, this has been a ton of fun and we really appreciate the time as, as we wrap up, uh, maybe tell listeners how they can get in touch and connect with you and Greenfield Robotics. Yeah, I think that, um, the best way they just shoot me a note and I'll just give a generic email address out. Um, uh, it's just, uh, they could just send it and it'll go straight to me as uh, reservations at uh, greenfieldrobotics.com. It's it's intended for farmers that are interested in working with us, but anyone can send me a note to that. Awesome. We'll be sure to link that in the show notes. Clint, thanks so much for being with us. Hey, thank you. I, I really appreciate it. So, Ty, what do you think? That was a ton of fun talking to Clint. I think he's just super sharp guy, really, really smart about how they're building the business. And I just think getting getting things done, right? I think that's a huge, huge part of business is just making steps forward and, and pushing an idea forward. And it was funny, he didn't know about regenerative agriculture, but had intuitively thought about that direction of the company and, and the goal of reducing chemicals. And then he discovered this whole space that is regenerative. So it's it's awesome to see how his intu- intuition was spot on. Totally. I really encourage everyone to reach out to Clint. He's really active on LinkedIn and really posts some interesting thought leadership pieces about what he's doing and around the regenerative agriculture space. And just love his perspective, actually being a farmer himself and deploying sales strategies where he really, really walks the, walks the walk. Well, guys, thanks so much for tuning in. We appreciate it. We'd love if you pass this podcast along to a friend. If you know anyone, whether it's a friend, a colleague, share the podcast. Hit the share button. Tell them a little bit about what we're doing with The Modern Acre. We'd really appreciate you helping us spread the word. Definitely. As always, guys, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week. Bye.